did our first archive article, which was titled Portfolio Optimization of 40 Stocks Using D-Wave's Quantum Annealer. And we were very excited. We did 40 stocks. We, um, we documented exactly what we did so that people could replicate the work. And then it came out on the 7th. It was great. We got it out there. And then two days later, we used D-Wave to do 60 stocks. And honestly, we're probably going to do 80 stocks. doesn't matter. We don't have a limit yet using the three-year-old D-Wave. But um, using 60 stocks, we actually picked a portfolio because we did a survey. And people said they wanted to see whether this thing could actually pick some stocks or not. And um, published a Medium article that was on the 15th. So that's two days ago. And we published our two portfolios. I intended to do one. We did two. And so what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to walk you through the Medium article where how we did it, um, ask questions. I, I can't do a demo because the team doesn't want me to share the code, but um, maybe privately we can. And um, I'll walk you through how we did it. I've also got the spreadsheet up I used, you know, at the very end, how to make the decisions. Um, then I'll walk you through the research article that we published. And so, and I'll give you a sense of the, of what we tried to accomplish and uh, what we invented, basically. We invented two things that were important. So I'm going to start by talking about quantum stock portfolios and what we did and how you'll find this is if you look for me in Medium, Jeffrey Cohen, and then you click on it, the top one. <clears throat> Thank you for the claps, by the way, 51, it's pretty cool. And uh, so we're going to start it off. So we picked data on July 10th, 2020. We take closing data. We, we do it from Yahoo Finance. And we use the Y Finance Python um, function. Thank you for the, the person who actually maintains it. And we not only pick 60 stocks, which was A through C, and then we filled in a bad stock with PayPal. But we also download indices, NASDAQ composite, S&P 500, um, Wilshire 5000, Russell 2000, and the uh, risk-free asset that we choose is a 13-week treasury. And um, so we download those. So our starting point is those 60 liquid assets. We keep it in memory, we write it to a CSV, and we run our code. The idea is that we're running our code over and over again against the same data. So we ran it on D-Wave. We actually ran 70,000 samples. So what that means, we usually run like 500 hits and then sometimes we run 1,000. And so we ran probably 100 different experiments to come up with 3,556 valid portfolios. So in, and I'll explain our formulation later, I'll, I just wanna give you the, uh, the net net of it first. We're feeding the system a symmetrical 60 by 60 matrix. So what happens is you have your expected returns of the stocks, you have your variance of the stock, you have your covariance of the stock, and you have to piece all that together into a cubo, into a matrix. And every time you ask D-Wave, you have the weights of those stocks and not portfolio. So it's equal weighted. So if I have 10 stocks, it's 10%, 20 stocks, it's 5%, 50 stocks, each one's 2%. So now I have to send it 60, 60 by 60 matrices to get the valid answers I want. So that's probably one of the more important things that we figured out is different matrices for different weightings of the stocks. So just to show you kind of what the solution space is, 60 assets is two to the 60th, or it's 10 to the 18th solution space. It's a pretty big number. I think it's a quadrillion, not a number I'm used to saying very often. And so what happens is we run it on D-Wave. It cost us 30% of our D-Wave minute that we get. That's our monthly computing budget. So it took about 20 seconds of compute time to run 70,000 hits to get 3,556 valid quantum portfolios. So why are we doing it on a quantum computer? 
takes too long on a classical. If we want to brute force it and run all those calculations, you just can't do it. We, we do Monte Carlo runs to check our answers. We can do about 750 million dice throws before we exceed memory. So normally we'll do like 50,000 at a time, but we can do, we'll do 700 million if we need to. And so down below, just to show you what we were doing is we came up with a new way to place the problem on the D wave. That's our real innovation was the quantum computer doesn't divide. So if you give it something that requires division, it won't work. So sharp ratio, oh yeah, it's the um, D wave 2000 Q. I think we started on um, system five, we moved to system six. We don't use the hybrid, we don't use a simulated annealer. Thanks for the question. Um, so it's QPU. So, um, we have this um, Chicago quantum net score formulation that's in the article, I'll explain it in a minute, but it allows you to just use addition and subtraction. So it allows you to do linear algebra using a matrix directly on the cubo. And so this chart made me very happy when I saw it because this is your efficient frontier with 50,000 dice throws, that's the blue. And the red is the 3,556 Chicago quantum ratio scores when recalculated back as sharp ratios. So we take all the data, we basically go back and run them again to get all the right ratios. And you see how the red almost entirely covers the blue and in some cases extends much further. So that means these 3,500 uh, D-wave answers actually push further through the efficient frontier than you get just with random sample. That's great, okay? The other way we run it is we run a genetic algorithm, which is a really nice way to, um, it's just a nice way to find your best values, your, your right away best answer, so genetic algorithm. So we seed that, we have a really greedy way we do it. We give it 1,028 random portfolios. We run it like 150 generations, it's crazy. I just ran it today and you could take that down to 256 initial seeds. I think I got it to run with like 50 generations or 70 generations. You can get it down to like 12 seconds. And they return a two asset portfolio. So we run through it. Um, we're only allowing ourselves to pick our portfolios out of the quantum portfolios that we were given. So out of these red dots. So. Let me go through and explain what we did. So we start with the five best portfolios based on the maximum value of the Sharp ratio and the Chicago quantum ratio. Again, I'll explain exactly what those are when we get to the paper. The Sharp ratio is, is the thing everyone thinks about. It's profit for every unit of risk and you move them both into a percentage. So I'm gonna earn 10% profit or return on 2% risk, 10 over two is five, that's a sharp ratio of five. What we do with the Chicago quantum ratio is we don't use any of the data like normal re uh, nominal returns or risk-free rate. We just use covariance of the stock against the market to come up with a proxy for beta. So it, it, a great score would be a 1.0. So we call it market momentum over standard deviation and the sharp ratio is nominal returns over standard deviation of returns. So they're both percentages. So these two generally move hand in hand. What I like about the Chicago quantum ratio is by getting rid of nominal returns um, and just looking at covariance, you get a purer sense of the momentum of that stock. So these five portfolios give us really low risk and low return portfolios. They are very conservative. None of the five solutions contain the two genetic algorithm stocks recommended. And so we just selected the best uh, maximum Chicago quantum ratio as our portfolio, it had six assets. 
Yeah, I'm getting a question about um, portfolio management. Normally they say 30 stock mix is the optimal mix. Um, what's interesting is we're, um, our formulation, this may be a research question that we have to continue to dive into, or this just may be how the data rolls, but we're finding the best portfolios are not the ones with the most stocks in them. So 60 out of 60, or in this case, if you had 40 out of 40, it's actually not a very good Sharpe ratio. It's not a very good Chicago quantum ratio. It's not a very good Chicago quantum net score. And you probably don't make a lot of money using it, which concerns me because that's the whole basis of um, passive investing. We're finding that six or seven stocks allows for enough offsetting variance and covariances that you really like get a winning portfolio. So I, I came in thinking 20 stocks is gonna be the minimum, but in fact, six assets in this one, the other one's seven or eight assets. So that was a finding from the data. So, so now we've picked a um, low risk, low return. Now let's go for the Chicago quantum net score. This is, a, um, this is basically a subtraction. So whereas one of them was, give me the profit over the risk as a percentage. This one is give me the cost and variance minus the expected return. There's a power transformation to have them to be the same order of magnitude. So variance minus profit, basically. That value should be negative. So if it is, it means my expected returns overweigh my variance and I'm gonna make money. So we pick those. In this one, it was interesting. So th these scores tend to be on smaller portfolios. Out of the 3,500, we had to scroll past five, 429 of the best portfolios to get any portfolio with 10 or more assets. Those were 25 asset and 27 asset portfolios. The best four portfolios with no quantum qubit chain breaks, and that's where the system remains fully connected. I don't think it's fully entangled, but it's fully connected so that every qubit is talking to every other qubit, no matter how long the chain lengths are, they're not breaking. Those were seven or eight assets. So the absolute best with a very tiny chain break of 3% had six assets. So we looked at the four and then we picked the best Chicago quantum ratio and just so happened the best sharp ratio out of those four and we came up with the best one and that had seven assets. So now let's talk a little bit about size because size seems to matter in terms of these portfolios. I'm also looking at the question. Um, so let's come here. So this chart shows the Chicago quantum net score versus the number of assets. Um, lower is better. And so, and this is an average. So the average in this chart shows that the larger you get up until about 13 or 14 assets, then it flatlines. So your average is about flat. So you're, you're not really looking at a ratio that is uh, that sensitive. It doesn't seem to be sensitive to size, but in fact, I have another chart which I was running today which shows that the best scores go the other way. It goes up. So your smallest portfolios have the best, basically the best ratios. And as you get larger and larger, you revert to the mean. And so your largest portfolios tend to be very average. So now I wanna talk about the answer. So there's no reason why large or small portfolios should be favored um, in terms of just the formulation. Now it's just the data. So here's what we picked. And in fact, um, I, have a, uh, I have a chart with some summary statistics going down. So the Chicago quantum net score portfolio has ADI, AMP, APA, BA, which is Boeing, BAC, BHC, and BLK. So these have a 16.529% expected annual return based on beta times the market returns 
plus then the risk-free return. So market minus risk and then add the risk-free return. And the standard deviation of 3.7% of returns. That's a really high expected return for an optimal portfolio. The Chicago quantum ratio is much more conservative, right? That has a sharp ratio of 4.96. I think the best one in the whole solution set was like 5.0 something. And this has a return of 8.573 and a standard deviation of 1.7. So this is a very, very low, um, a low, uh, low risk, low return portfolio. We did not intend to show both. We intended just to pick one portfolio. The universe of stocks, um, that's, uh, that's the 60 that they came from. I have a couple questions. I'm going to, I'm going to jump over and make sure I answer it. So um, from Alex, um, just a statement. It is not um, a fully connected Chimera system. This is the Pegasus system. And so what happens is there's chains of qubits and those chains are linking links of linking links so that to get all the qubits to talk to each other, I might have quite a few links. And so that's okay. And um, we have to watch for if a solution has broken chains. But after every run, it goes back to like no chain breaks. So I just wanted to share that. So what's our summary? We selected two stock portfolios out of the results of a D-Wave system. So it gave us 3,556. We picked, oh, it costs us 20 seconds of quantum computing time. The two stocks selected by the genetic algorithm, which is the really the deepest, best answer, AMP and APA, show up in all of the Chicago quantum net score portfolios. And those had relatively higher expected returns and risk. The best sharp ratio or CQR portfolios had relatively lower returns and risk. It was 40 to 50% lower. And so just a disclaimer, um, we have no evidence that any of these portfolios are optimal or best or even great. They're the best we could do with a quantum computer in 20 seconds and um, lots of other classical work. What was amazing was that in that 20 seconds, we found a lot of portfolios to look at. So let's talk a little bit about the 60 that we chose from. So in fact, before I do that, let me go back. So the Chicago quantum ratio portfolio picked Amazon, ATR, BAC, you know, Bank of America, BMY, Bank of Montreal, um, CERN, and Charter, CHRW. So let's, let's dig in. We're picking a lot of stocks that people should have heard of, right? You get American Express, got Apple, Berkshire Hathaway, there were a lot of stocks, um, Citigroup, there were a lot of stocks I was surprised didn't show up. And so, and then again, our indices, um, S&P 500, Russell 2000, Wilshire, um, NASDAQ Composite, and a risk-free. So you can do this. Maybe later on, I'll have to do like a, like a demo. I was asked to do one for London. Um, and it's just a quick disclosure before I jump over, and then I'll open it up for questions. So just a full disclosure, um, I or the team, which is Alex Kahn and Clark Alexander, have no positions in any of the stocks mentioned, unless they're in a mutual fund or a 401k that we don't manage. We have no plans to initiate positions in the next 72 hours. I wrote the article myself. I get no compensation from anyone other than Medium. So thanks for reading. We might get a free cup of coffee this month. I have no business relationship with any stock mentioned. The article reflects ongoing research and development. This is not investment advice. And the portfolios are built on quantum annealing hardware out of, you know, out of Canada, but D-Wave systems, which carries its own additional risks, not just investing risks. And we're not an investment manager. So with all that said, let me open up for questions. And then I'm gonna switch over and walk you through the paper, which puts a little bit of rigor behind some of the formulations. So if anyone wants to unmute, go ahead. Or if you want to type questions, I'll answer them. Oh, and it is okay to record. 
I'm sorry. I know that uh, Balaji is recording and um, we'll make it available as well. All right, let's see if I can switch my, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a new share. I'm going to switch the paper now. All right, so here's the paper. I'm, I'm also going to try to uh, make this uh, as interesting as possible because I don't know uh, how many people like reading research papers. Personally, it was really fun to write. And so portfolio optimization of 40 stocks using D-waves, quantum annealer, and the authors, again, myself, Alex Kahn, and uh, Clark Alexander. So let's start with what we were trying to do. So when we started this research about six months ago, we hadn't read a published piece of work that optimized even 20 stocks in a way that was rigorous. You had a Venturelli and Kondratif that made some really, what we thought were some really high level um, uh, shortcuts. Lee Brain talked about a toy problem. We just didn't see anything that we could sink our teeth into. So we said, all right, let's optimize 20 stocks. And then what we realized is we can optimize 40 stocks and have a really high degree of quality. And we just explain how. So the first thing we're doing is we're maximize expected returns while minimizing the variability of those returns. And that's what we call risk. This, this is a buy and hold strategy. We, we did find, by the way, where we ran something and within the course of two hours, some arbitrage that we had identified with our model was gone. But this is a buy and hold strategy. So Jeffrey, can I interrupt for a second? Oh, please do. And your name is Virenda? Virenda. Hi. Hi, everyone. So basically, I wanted to know when you said we are doing the optimization, we saw that a lot of symbols, 60 socks, 30 socks, whatever mix we have taken, was there an upper limit to the amount of investment also put there? Like how much are we putting at? Like half a million, 1 million, 100,000, 50,000, 20,000? Ah, good question. So Thank we you. have some rules in building the portfolio. Right. And let, I'm going to go to the section to see if I have them written up. I think we do. And if not, I'm just going to have to talk them through. So just give me a moment. And while you're scrolling, I'll add my question. Has this yep. been put into any commercial use as well or not so far? So I'll answer the second one first. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to answer the second. So I'll answer the second one first. No commercial sure. use. We, for the first time ever, even picked a portfolio. And that was this week. And we put it out there, which took a lot of bravery, I think. <laughs> yes, that is. So, because okay. it's such a dynamic effort, number one. Number two, when we are trying to do this optimization and market is dynamic and results come out, whatever number of stocks we are picking up, they are also dynamically moving each one of them separately. So the question which I'm trying to ask here is, with the quantum computing capability, is that enabling us better than the classical sense where instead of 20 or 30, we are gone to 60 mix and that was still able to compute it efficiently and faster. And at what point we decided, yes, we want to break it for results or all that was pre-fed in conditions that yes, I'm going to run it ah. for this much time. And then okay. they can... So that's good. So the first thing is, so every stock included in the portfolio has the same amount of investment. Investment is capped at 100% and there's no shorting of stocks. Awesome. So those are your basic rules. Um, we could do market cap weighting, but that's just computationally a little tougher. There's no reason we couldn't do it. We stopped at 40 stocks because we had really good understanding of the energy landscape. We went to 60 stocks because the energy landscape also works great at 60 with the 2000 qubits. We have not tried to break it. So we haven't gone to 80 or 100. So I don't know what will happen. We, um, 
when you pick stocks based on volatility, it's a non-emotional thing. So what, what happens, I tweet a lot on um, investment analysts who say, uh, the market is both too high and too low. Buy dividend stocks, they're great. Your kids will love you for it. Or I don't even understand half the stuff they're saying, right? But what I understand is when the treasury puts a billion, a trillion dollars a month into the market, the stocks move a certain way. All we're looking at is variance of stocks against each other, a covariance against each other, and then covariance of the stock against the market. So we had found some places where, as an example, GE and Boeing were not being picked up. So all the stocks were moving, they weren't. It stuck out, right? So that's interesting, because if they're not moving, that tells you something. So we're making um, stock picks based on the underlying variability of the stocks against each other in the market. Coming. So is it good? I think it is completely non-emotional. And the other thing I liked was that if you remember in the article, there was like a, a high risk and a low risk portfolio. Yeah. There's people that want to earn 16, 17% and are willing to put three or 4% at risk. And there's other people, maybe, you know, well, I call them the widows and orphans, right? They want to earn 8% and sleep great at night with a 2% risk profile. It's how much risk you can handle. Yes. So did I answer your questions? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. More questions, please, because I, I like to speak to people. Yes, this is Ramesh. Uh, thank you for the presentation and really great work from you and your team, uh, your colleagues. Uh, just have a quick question. I, I think you uh, talked about expanding from 20 to 40 to 60, as well as the insights you got that a smaller portfolio potentially delivers better returns, which I think... Uh, uh, I, um, you know, I totally understand that perspective of it. And with respect to what Virendra also brought up, uh, the dynamic aspect of the markets. You know, if we look at COVID-driven uh, market and the, and the scenario that you mentioned with the, the Fed pumping money, uh, you looked at covariance as well as pricing, uh, prior pricing data to build the portfolio right, uh, to analyze it and build a portfolio. Uh, but if we factor in the current COVID situation or in general, uh, there is a premium in the, in, the, in the market for a stock on top of its value, right? Well, it could be positive or negative, uh, undervalued or overvalued. Um, I think that would be a, it, it, that would be a, uh, on, uh, you know, uh, that's the unknown value in a portfolio that I think uh, would be really valuable to compute with uh, with the machine like this and the approach you have taken because uh, uh, it really is uh, is not the you know what what you have here kind of goes into the portfolio selection process and you know we narrowed it down to a smaller set of portfolios. Uh, but I think the variability and the dynamic aspects of portfolios, even using portfolio theory, where you generally don't change your portfolio a great deal. Now, I looked at annual portfolio uh, adjustment to quarterly, to monthly, to even weekly, uh, based on some of the work I'm doing on, uh, on my algorithms. And I found out that there's a, not a great deal of difference when you shorten the period. Um, oh, so okay. you're asking about the, the period of time that we measure the volatility. Correct. Uh, and, and the period of time you measure the volatility plus the, I'm just challenging the, the selection process uh, in terms of the premium, which is positive or negative, which is overvalued or undervalued aspect of a stock, which is based on a number of other parameters, fundamental parameters, which uh, which is kind of uh, aggregated into the price, right? Uh, so I wonder if you had any thoughts about that. I know this is kind of your 
Plus, no, 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 no. I, I, abso I absolutely have thoughts. So let yeah. me tell you what I know. And then let me tell you what I don't know. Sure. Thank you. First thing is the period. So we started with a five-year look, buy and hold for five years. What we found was that we lost too much volatility. We, in five, for one year to five years, you lose two thirds of your variance. Mm -hmm. We revert to the mean like crazy over five years. So what that meant was the D wave didn't have enough energy landscape. I, um, to me, the D wave is like climbing a mountain with your hands and your feet and you're looking for footholds. And so, you need enough footholds to grab on. If the, if the energy landscape is too flat, it doesn't catch anything. So I, we haven't thought about going to, let's say, a 30-day mm -hmm. or a 15-day volatility cycle. But if I was doing short-term trading, it's four lines of code. We're looking at 15-day volatility or 30-day mm -hmm. volatility. Mm -hmm. You could probably even do it in like, one, two, or three-day volatility. If you really want to look at kind of the horses running in the race right now, for us, a year was fine, right? Because then we can look at stocks that move over a course of a year. Right. So that was the first. The second is pricing plays no impact in our stock selection. No pricing, no dividends. We assume that all of that is incorporated in the price of the stock at that moment. And the correlations. Well, the correlation comes from the trading action. The, um, the correlation covariance of the stock to the market is just showing. So if the market goes up 1%, the stock goes up 1%, mm -hmm. if it's a one. And so we really struggled with two things. One is we don't allow for negative beta stocks. We manually pick them out. Mm -hmm. We also manually remove any betas over 10. We had a couple stocks where they had an, um, an accounting irregularity or they had an acquisition. Those are story stocks. We, mm -hmm. we want nice smooth stocks that have traded every day for 253 trading days. Mm -hmm. So that's how we eliminate that. So there's no pricing. This return is looking within the sample. So we did talk to a finance professor who said, Jeff, make sure you mention that you're predicting future performance based on past performance. Right. Right. So it's, it's a 12 month look. So if the market went up, so right now our market index is up like 10 or 11%. That's NASDAQ, S&P, Russell, Wilshire, divided by four. Adjusted close, which takes into account dividends. So 10, 11%, well, that's great. If I could have a beta of two, I make 20%. But if people believe that the market's gonna drop tomorrow, our logic is um, they're out of the market. So we don't believe that market returns can be negative. So that's where my question is, Jeff, just to interject here, right? At yep. this, uh, is there in this model, is there any provision for any outlier events? For example, some new stock came in that made it to our list and it's having a good run and all of a sudden management decided to sell it today. Now the stock had a good run. It was already retracting. Management dumped the shares. Finally, is going to retract more coming Monday. It happened after market scenario, for example. Such kind of uh, events are they modeled into it, or they are not yet modeled? They are not yet modeled. Um, based on my relate prior relationship with a high frequency trader that owned right. a trading company, he would pull out those story stocks every morning. So from yeah, his that's true. That means whatever action has happened today, Friday after market, he's going to pull that out before Monday morning. Correct. Okay. And so you. that would be my intent as well. Get so rid of the story still, stocks. That is still the manual intervention there in this model, yes. which yes. makes sense. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to challenge here or anything. I'm just trying oh, to understand good. the base. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let me Thank walk you. you through the just 
Uh, for the... if, I, if I can add a comment to that, oh, Jeff. Go ahead, uh, please. Virendra, what asking about um, Virendra, they, uh, the, the short term adjustment is called tactical asset uh, uh, um, allocation. And the, the long term one, which is traditionally the, you know, the uh, portfolio uh, picks that are made either by hand or by analysis, or in this case, through the quantum uh, approach is the strategic asset allocation. That's traditionally how port portfolio management is done in, the, in terms of the process on the, on the investment side. Right, I mean, I agree. Thank you so much, uh, so much for that explanation. Though, I mean, uh, I, I totally understand. It's like, I saw that data on this uh, paper, which is like most recent, like 15 days old or something, July 2nd. Well, so I was, I was wondering, I said, this is a tremendous piece of work. I'm sure you will be getting flooded with the inquiries from all these hedge fund guys. Well, because, I'm hoping so, because we are a for-profit company. Yes, that's, so that's why I was, are, I was asking. My next question was, how many queries and how are you getting flooded or still picking not, up? Not flooded. Not flooded oh. at all. Um, I am shocked and surprised that people, so two things. I've had two real reactions. Sure. First is I had a hedge fund manager say, look, I'll give you 40 stocks. Give me your answer. And I said, okay, by the way, I'm a for-profit company. So I'm hoping someday you'll hire us. Right. I said, ah, don't worry about it then. So maybe mm -hmm. he wasn't interested. I, we have like a top seven investment manager where I know the president and um, she's an old friend of mine. And um, they're just not looking at quantum right now at all. It's a little bit too early. So do you think, Jeff, is it the reason the quantum is the reason behind or the results? Because if you have portrayed the right results and shown them the value, I don't think they should care what is behind it or is it the investment behind that they do care? Because uh, if you run the model simulation and everything and inherit this, then in that case, uh, they have to basically see everything in totality before they can accept and move yep. forward with your technology. So, so Virendra, let me try to help with this. Sure. There is no quantum supremacy. Right. There isn't. Oh. And in fact, there's quantum advantage for me because I can get 3,556 great portfolios in yeah. 20 seconds and I can spend a day analyzing them. So tomorrow morning when the market opens, I've just looked 10 ways to Sunday at, at those 60 stocks. And by the way, I have a model that doesn't use any quantum that gets me to the best 60 stocks. I can sift through the S&P 500. I can sift through a thousand stocks. I can get to 60 top stocks and then run them through the D wave in 20 seconds. And then Monday morning, I'm ready to go. So I yeah. can't do that with my classical tools, but I think the hedge funds and the investment managers who have 5,000 servers, I worked for a bank, they had 35,000 servers. They right. can do this. They don't need quantum to pick the 3,500 stock you know, portfolio universe. So I so think this is best for smaller companies, smaller investment managers. I have a question from this point of view. Um, so basically, I really like the fact that uh, this is buy and hold, uh, which means that it's stabilizing in the long run rather than people going crazy of buying and, and selling and, and trying to. I, and the other thing is actually showing that it's better to have few than many. Uh, and then that means that now occasionally you can change this. I mean, who are the few that you want to have to, to have the optimal? But then I'm wondering if, if I swift through the combinations, uh, I can look at actually six out of 40 combinations and it's about 4 million possibilities. Uh, and then from there, if I go a little bit lower or below, so uh, this, this is a loop that I can easily execute on a regular computer. Um, have you look at it and see how, how this would perform if you know that now a small set is subset is better and you don't need to, 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 to go everywhere. I mean, so, so if you knew, so start, 
So the, the real answer is it's just a few seconds. It's a handful yeah. of seconds. So yeah. let me tell you some ways that, by the way, the paper taught us something really cool though. So we could do a genetic algorithm, which gives us the two best stocks. Mm -hmm. And if I give it to 3,500 D-Wave portfolios, it does it faster. So the prof if, it, if you already give it good answers, it works faster. Mm -hmm. so that's yeah. the, the second is, you're right, we could do um, brute force if just six assets or seven yeah. assets or eight assets very fast. Mm -hmm. The third, this is why, you know, we shouldn't say quantum is like faster because in my mind, the advantage isn't speed. The third is we're working now on our simulated annealers. We're mm -hmm. using D-Wave simulated annealer and we're writing our own from scratch. In fact, we just worked with our, so Clark Alexander is a PhD in math writing a book on quantum. He does this for a living. And we believe that our simulated annealer could solve, we gave it enough time, a thousand stocks. Mm -hmm. So 60 doesn't even matter. Like we could do 200 stocks in like five minutes. So the truth is simulated annealer on 60 stocks would get you one great answer very fast as well. What this gave us is it gave us a texture of a whole bunch of portfolios that we could play with. Mm -hmm. And, and this is where, you know, in part it's a research effort because when D wave comes out with its new iteration, which is, which will be after about four years after the last one, it's going to be so much faster mm -hmm. that if we're ready now, I mean, imagine, 2,041 qubits with like, I don't know, three, co three connections each. And I think the next one is 5,000 and maybe 200. And I want to say it's seven or eight connections each. You're going to have a lot more processing. 15, 15, 15 each. Yeah. So it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so I want to be ready. Now, so let me zoom in. There was one thing about the D-Wave that shocked me a little bit. And by the way, I'm still finding it. So, and this is why we wanted to share the formulation and we want collaboration. So the Chicago quantum net score average value, if you guys can see my screen. So for small portfolios, the D wave, which is in blue, this was the, the values, not for the stock picking we did this week. This was for the paper. So this was like two weeks ago. Small portfolios, D-Wave loves them. D-Wave does better than average. In fact, five asset portfolios, eight asset portfolios, 10, 11, wow. The blue is so much lower than the red and that's better, lower is better. But when we got to 30 assets, in fact, you see it at 26, 29, 30, 31, 32, 34, D-Wave did worse than average on large portfolios. So we also think that there's something else going on. And if I was allowed to show you the code, what you would see is for smaller portfolio sizes, we give D-Wave more of an energy landscape, more of a, more peaks and valleys to dig into, to tunnel into. By the time we're at 30, 35, 38 assets, we have to smooth away a lot of that energy landscape. And here's why. Because you have to do a transformation, we call it scaling. And you have to scale all of the Cubo values to between one and negative one. I'm looking for where the math is. Yeah. The, the scaling right here. And that's what my first question was, yeah. Jeff, about 30 okay. number stocks. About are you doing scaling because usually it's mapping zero one is to minus one to one into the spin space? No, we, so ours is different. So imagine, okay. imagine you're building a matrix mm -hmm. and it's, and the matrix contains for, for 10 asset solutions, the weight, the expected return, the variance and the covariance. Mm -hmm. And it's accurate. So we do um, linear algebra 
manually and we, not manually, but with Python, and we confirm the answers from the D-Wave because mm -hmm. we want to make sure there's no funny business. And so your values tend to be, you know, decimal places, right? They're positive and negative. We actually make the expected returns on the linear, for those that know how to program these things. Your quadratic terms, in our case, are positive. They contain your variance, covariance. Your linear terms on the diagonal contain your expected returns. Those we flip to negative. Mm -hmm. By doing that, we get the right eigenvalues, which is great. We get a uh, semi-definite matrix, but some of the, per the percentages are like 0 0.0001 or 0 0.001. If you try to give D-Wave that, what they do is they scale the linear let's say by 500, and they scale the quadratic by let's say 800. So at the end, your math doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You have to do the scaling so that it's between let's say one and negative one. Their documentation suggests negative 0 0.8 to positive 0 0.8, but we found that that extra 20% on either end, we lost too much um, variability of the energies. So we do a hyperbolic tangent scaling from negative one to one. And uh, it, it's, it's for us, it's better, but that means when you get to 60 assets and you do a color view of your cubo, your matrix is almost all yellow. Whereas when, when assets is two, three, four, five, there's a lot of richness. By the time you get to 40, 50, 60 assets, you lose all your richness. I believe that the D-Wave doesn't know what to do with the smooth energy landscape. And that's why we saw less at the back end. So it, I'm glad everyone is saying, Jeff, it makes sense. Small portfolios are better. But if I find even one academic that says, Jeff, I'm very disappointed that you can't get large portfolios to perform, perform we're going to have to redouble those efforts because honestly, this is where I'm spending a little bit of my research time is how do I get the top end of the size to perform just as well as the bottom end? So you are looking at that magic number to scale. Per asset, per, per portfolio size. Yeah, exactly. Yep. But that, right. that could be the problem when you have a big portfolio you get some of the bad apples in the basket, which rotten your good apples. And yes. <laughs> and that's where, again, every next morning, you have to go back to picking those bad apples, getting them out, and again, maintaining the portfolio basket. So, so let me share my first heuristic that I came up with when we were writing the paper. I'm looking for my uh, heuristic section. Because I came up with the silliest name, All Stars and Dog Stars. So I found a way to articulate those bad apples. I call them Dog Stars. So what we do is we could just run 40, 60 assets at a time just to pick out the bad portfolios, the minimum sharp ratios, the worst Chicago quantum net scores, and then we look at, let's say, the top 50 portfolios, and we look at the stocks that always appear. Those are dog stars. They poison the portfolio. You can keep a list of those. By the way, I bet the best way to make money is to publish a list of stocks not to hold. At the same time, you can run through and identify the all stars. So pick your best sharp ratios. You know, if you're doing 60 assets, maybe you pick the best six and you say, those are the best stocks. And then what happens is, we found this to be true, if you put a portfolio together of 10 sets of six all-stars, your sharp ratios and all your metrics are better. So winners put together make even more winning portfolios. But don't you think that when you have all the winners in the portfolio, you tend to stick to the winners and there could be a bad time when market turns and the winners could become losers or you diminish on your profits. That's where the discipline comes in. And that's another ball game 
for the model. So, yes, trading behaviors and discipline yeah. is always good. So, but imagine if you ran this once a week. And what you're really looking for, though, is we can't predict the market going up or down. But what you can say is, I feel nervous today. I'm going to take some money off the table. Or I feel nervous today, and I'm going to swap some of my stocks to a lower risk, kind of like a risk-off portfolio. I can cut 50, 40 to 50% of my risk just by picking portfolio B. Right, so there's nervous, 50% of the risk, still a high so, quality portfolio. So the question would be, where would this magic number fall if this were to be a trading portfolio versus this would be a growth portfolio? I don't know. Um, I, I can't answer that. I, I'm wondering another thing. You, you mentioned uh, in the portfolio all the stocks, I mean, you invest equal, the same amount. They, yes. There is no sense. Well, how about, I mean, how difficult is if you try to say, okay, the risky ones, I'll put less, and the ones that are less risky, I'll put a little bit more. So to actually adjust how much you invest in different kind of uh, stocks based on their risk, and then trying to do that uh, through like week, every week or, I mean, because uh, I, I talk with some people doing in finance and they say they do rebalancing, but it very much depends on how they as, assess how much fee they'll have to pay and what will be the down the road may be able right. to win. Because if you do it too often, you may be just losing money in too, too much fees. So we wrote a paragraph on this very topic in the paper. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not exactly what you're asking, but it was, what if we wanted to weight the assets differently? And so we could have the quantum computer calculate the discrete weights. And it could actually give you a better answer because it could say 12% in this, 1.04 in that, 16 in that. And when we did that, it's pretty cool because you end up with these like weird portfolios of like a quarter percent in one, 40% in another, two in this one. But here's the challenge. If I want to do any kind of like a fact checking, um, the, the solution space is huge. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, right, I'm doing two to the U if U is 40 stocks or U is 60 stocks. If I wanted to allow a 1% weighting delta, now I'm at 101 to the U. <laughs> and I'm not even sure D-Wave is going to get me that type of a search space. I'm not sure there's that many atoms in the universe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's where my first question was, Adam, uh, Jeff, and I was asking for the magic number of trading versus, uh, versus uh, uh, growth portfolio in the sense that with the current capability we have, are we able to put that into the research model to get to some answers? So let's talk offline because I don't know what you mean by trading model versus like a buy and hold model. Uh, gro growth model, growth I said model. trading versus growth. Because that's normally when you go as a customer to any hedge fund, you okay. mainly, mainly are asked this question. Okay, are you into the growth? Are you into growth value? Or you are into risk tolerant portfolio? So uh, that's where my question is coming. All from. right, all right. So that one would require a little bit of conversation. By the way, full disclosure, I used to work for Bridgewater. Bridgewater Associates. And so I hate risk. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone knows. I hate it. I want to I want to diversify away. By the way, our next research, once we get I mean our goal, we had a conversation last week with a vendor. We'd love to get 250 assets at a time, 2 to the 250. But realistically, we're doing 60, we'll do 80, we'll do 100. We're looking for that upper limit. But we've got to add in Bitcoin and currencies 
I want fixed income. I want real estate investment trusts. I want commodities. I want gold. I want silver. I want oil. Because if I can pick a portfolio, let's say that had 10 stocks, one currency, two real estates, and a commodity, I believe I could diversify a lot more risk out. But the math and the frequency of the data is so different, I worry about that wave function, right? I right. trade every second with visibility. My fixed income, I don't have good visibility. And I don't trade as often, right? AT&T bonds, maturity, 9.2 years. I, I might trade once a week. So I don't know what to do. Uh, Bitcoin's great because there's a market, but I'm not sure how transparent the pricing is. So True. we're working on that as a, as a future enhancement. Um, hey, so, Jeffrey. Hi, uh, hi Skylar. Hi, um, I'm wondering, so you've been talking a lot about this strategy to optimize the risk return percentage over the risk percentage. Yes. And I'm just wondering um, if you've thought about using this Cubo mapping for finding stocks that are similar for like arbitrage trading. Um, I feel like this would be an easy way to avoid the ups and downs of the market or um, yeah, like what's happening with COVID. You just find a pair of stocks that are similar to one another and you trade between that. Um, how would that work? I mean, it, it seems like you did allude to it's easier to find winners when you already know of a few. Is that, has that been working for you, finding stocks that are similar? Well, that's really interesting. Um, so I have thought about it, but I've never talked to the team about it. And so let me, uh, I'll, I'll show a little bit of, uh, of private thinking. So to answer your question directly, you mm -hmm. can just flip the ratio and you could say, give me the stocks that have the closest risk return. So, or, or the worst risk return. So they move really, really, really much together for mm -hmm. every unit of risk I take. So I could, I could look for uh, almost perfect correlation between stocks. And so where you might mm -hmm. find that, if I can imagine a real life scenario, Warren Buffett is taking an investment in Coca-Cola and he decides to buy up calls in Pepsi. And so he's okay. jacking them both up just to make sure like, I, you know, he doesn't get caught. Or you could look at the, the defense contractors, right? It's a good time in the defense industry. There's a big contract award coming up and suddenly you have General Dynamics, Boeing, Lockheed Martin all moving in lockstep. There's a, ton of arbitrage potential there yeah. um we you could easily change the formulation to do that and i'll show you where you would do it okay. and of course yes we would we would be open to doing that it, if you would wouldn't mind let me walk through the math real quick yeah. get to answer your question because no one ever wants to walk through the math so <laughs> the sharp ratio is the weight of the stocks times your classical beta. Can you zoom it so more, a little bit? Can you zoom it? Oh, of course I can. Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. So every stock is weighted the same. So W just ends up being a constant for that size of portfolio. Beta mm -hmm. is traditional beta. Expected return of the risk uh, the, the reward for that risky portfolio minus your risk-free return, just for the record, four, four indices. And I know that Wilshire and S&P 500 today look the same, but they don't always. So it's Wilshire, it's S&P, it's NASDAQ, and it's Russell. Um, by the way, Russell's horrible. Russell's been in negative territory since we started doing the research. So we okay. set a floor at two and a half percent return because no one's going to hold the Russell to lose money. So we assume they think they're going to earn something, at least dividends. And the risk-free return has been running around one to one and a quarter percent. It's your 13 week U S treasury averaged over the year. If it goes negative, we have a floor in that too. We floor it to zero over the standard deviation 
of the returns. So the standard deviation of the return of the portfolio is the square root of the weights transposed times the covariance matrix, which we make sure the eigenvalues are all positive and it's not a weird covariance ratio, you know, matrix times the weights. So W transpose covariance W of every stock against each other. And then we decided, get rid of all this noise. Who wants beta and return? I, I could be in a religious argument for a year about risk-free returns. Just do the weight times the covariance of that stock against the index. We had to pick an index. We pulled the stocks in the S&P 500, so we compare them against S&P 500 over the same standard deviation. This, by the way, holy grail, because it eliminates so much noise in your sharp ratios. I could have a sharp ratio go from 4% to 5% because of a good or bad day in the market. Chicago quantum ratio might vary from 1.07 to 1.05. It's nice. We reformulate this into the same matrix math. We tried, by the way, you know, when they say, uh, just take the log, it's like subtraction. So we tried. We took the log of the expected returns minus the log of the standard deviation. And what happens is you get tripped up in the math because your variances and your covariances get broken up and you can't put them back together again without some Taylor series and your errors add up and are too high. So I can't do that. We tried. Jeff, so what I we Jeff, I have a question on CQR. Okay, go for it. Uh, the weighting that you have there, is that fixed? For a portfolio or is it very, very? It's fixed for the size of the portfolio. So if it's 10 assets, it's 10%. If it's 20 assets, it's 5%. Does that make sense? So it does, but I'm, I'm curious if, uh, if uh, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole set of different portfolios in, by adjusting the weights, right? Uh, so, so this is what I, I don't mean to talk over you, but just to get to the, the meat. Right. Um, 101 to the power of 40, if I want to allow 1% gradients, mm -hmm. versus two to the power of 40, if I fix the weights. I can do two to the power of 40 on a D wave, I can do it on a laptop. Right, right. 101 to the power of 40, I don't know if I'm ever doing that. Right, got it, thank you. That's the issue, yep. So the CQNS, the Chicago Quantum Net Score, and I apologize that we named it. I, I heard that it, until we're peer reviewed, we shouldn't name our ratios, but we are a for-profit company and we plan on marketing these names. So this is the variance of the return. So think variance, think 0 0.00141 minus the expected return of each portfolio raised to a power. We started with a power of alpha equals one, so raised to the third power, but it could be different. When you do this subtraction, so when you talked about, hey, Jeff, can you, so that, that was all the math we had to talk about. But if you said, Jeff, give me high correlations, I could just reverse them. I could look at maximizing variance. I could look at maximizing the CQNS, not minimizing it to try to pick different types of portfolios. And, and I love the idea of finding stocks that move in lockstep, if nothing else, just to tell my mom not to buy them. <laughs> you know, mom, diversify. So let me just give a little more um, feeling about why you should be happy when you look at these. So when we first started running these portfolios, my God, maybe this was a month ago, this chart, six weeks ago, we said, let's run the sharp ratio, which is orange. That's your efficient frontier. And then let's look at the Chicago quantum ratio. And that tended to be the same shape, but it also extended a little bit lower. So it made it a little more conservative. And then let's look at the Chicago quantum net score. And that was kind of in the middle here. And we said, all right, at least we're okay. At least we are starting to cover the efficient frontier with our D-wave answers. That made us feel good that we weren't kind of off in left field. Just so you guys know, the holy grail of the D-wave, if we ever get this, 
we're not going to publish it. We're probably going to sell it to a hedge fund. If we could drive significant increases in expected return for the same unit of risk, that's really what we want. And so we want to push the values higher. What we found was that our latest run with 60 assets allowed us to beat poor performing Monte Carlo analyses or what you might find on Python or find in uh, the internet. So we can beat poor performing efficient frontier calculators. We just can't beat brute force. And as somebody mentioned before, if you knew the best answer was six assets, you could brute force six assets all day long in seconds, single digit seconds, and uh, test your results. Um, trying to think of anything else that's kind of interesting in the annealing computer. So, so the first thing is the formulation allows us to put the formula on the quantum computer. Without that linearization, you can't run the D wave. So that was kind of like thing one. Thing two was that we, so thing two is also a three dimensional matrix. It's not a tensor because tensors tend to be continuous. This is just three dimensional. So one asset, 60 times 60, two assets, 60 times 60. And we feed D wave a three dimensional 60 by 60 by 60 matrix. If we had a hundred stocks, it'd be a hundred by a hundred by a hundred. Those numbers shouldn't scare anyone. They're not that big. The third thing is when you looked at scaling the, the, the values, we talked about scaling from negative one to one a lot of embedding happens. So you embed the problem. The more assets you have, the more of these chain lengths you have, the more of these weak links you have. And so there's a thing called chain strength. So we found that if we increase the chain strength, it, it defaults to one. We've taken it to 10, 15, which is crazy talk. So what we find is we get very few answers, but we get no chain breaks it reduces the sensitivity of the D wave. If we take chain strength down to close to zero, like a 0 0.1, we get tons of good answers, but we get chain breaks. So that was why one of our best portfolios had 3% chain break, because we lowered chain strength, but we get more richness of the portfolios to look at. The other thing we discovered was this thing, this affine transformation. So I'm not a mathematician, so I call it lift and shift, right? So we can lift and shift the values of the matrix so that the best answers from our perspective. So if you're a 24 asset cubo, you want D-Wave to find 24 assets. But with 60 assets, 24 assets, there's 1.1 times 10 to the 18 total solutions and you want it to find like 100 million, or worse yet, two asset solutions to check your genetic algorithm, there's 1,700 of those out of 10 to the 18th, right? So you have to shift your values. It's not offset, because offset is how you set zero in a D-wave. This is shifting all the values of the assets that aren't the one you want. So 24 out of 60 or two out of 60, those values stay perfect, but you can skew the, the answers through this type of scaling and it, it makes D-Wave look where you want it to look. Without this, we weren't getting good results at all. So the two things we invented, one was the linearization of the sharp ratio and the other was lift and shift. So let me open it up for questions. We still have 31 people, brave souls that are still out there. So uh, unless you guys want me to walk through more of the paper, um, let me open it up. I actually could show you a little bit more about the asset portfolio and stuff, but that's, let me open it. Ask away guys. So Jeff, uh, one question is, one is you're targeting hedge funds. But the second is, what about individual investors? So 
our first target audience is the investor with less than a million dollars to invest that wants to spend 50 bucks. I wanted to have an application. This is in our NSF grant proposal, which we never got. It's still being pending. I want to charge 50 bucks. I want someone to be able to come in, a widow and an orphan, small investor, and say, guys, just give me some good advice. Is my portfolio good? And I want to be able to come back and um, just show, you know, good results. So that would be an app. I'm not sure anyone would pay 50 bucks, but maybe they would. They would. I think you should put it up for the market. Okay. So that's the first one. That's our business model. That's going to pay for more than coffee, but it still wouldn't pay for salaries. Exactly. So, but it's you nice. Start with coffee somewhere, right? I know. Someone's got to pay for it. <laughs> the uh, hedge funds, investment managers, um, operators are standing by. <laughs> Give us a call, right? Come on in. Because the reality as the is... Slide, as part of the last slide, put that as I, your stuff, please. I, I just hope someone's going to call us. The, uh, the reality is, I talked to the Federal Reserve Bank when we started this research. They said, Jeff, the only thing we're doing with quantum is security, post-quantum crypto. And every investment manager I've talked to either has a little secret program or they don't care. And so... I really would like to even help an inv like an, an asset manager, Goldman Sachs, just understand kind of what we're learning. And then also from them, they have market data sources that we don't have. I'm using Yahoo Finance. There's probably errors in there. And so I would say- um, It's pretty know, interesting because Yahoo Finance was the first place to get all this very centralized information for normal public, general public. And now there are plentiful other places, but I don't worry too much about the, I would say sanity of the information which they provide because that's still pretty good source. Yeah. And I haven't found errors, which has been great. Um, and it's free. Yeah, that's the most important piece. Yeah. So I'm putting in my contact information in the chat. So if anyone wants it. Sure. Thank you. And, and the best part is we don't even need to charge a lot. I mean, re, so the, the big cost for the hedge fund will be it's $2,000 an hour for D wave time. I'm living on one free minute a month. And if I wanted to spend 2000 bucks an hour, that's heavy, right? Like that's more than coffee. And so, if we have clients, we can start to do bigger and bigger things on the D-Wave. Maybe we could run 100 assets. So oh, let me know if you want to go beyond the minute. Well, we do. <laughs> and so that, that would require a contract and good access to data. And then we would work hard because we're still learning here. This is still research. The, the good news is there's so much more we can do. And we know as an example, because we're playing with simulated annealers today, we believe that we're gonna be able to give the D-Wave a real run for its money. If we can use a simulated annealer, by the way, asset by asset slices, we think we could do 200 assets, which means I gotta go from 60 to 300 assets on D-Wave, right? To show that it's better. The truth is, it doesn't matter if it's better. It's the richness of the solutions that I get that allows me to, to, to make a better recommendation. Yeah, Jeff, uh, I have one question. Yep. So um, three years back, I, I attended one meetup where uh, they analyze satellite images um, every day and uh, get the logistics of uh, different uh, malls. So they see the uh, movements of uh, trucks and based on that, they predict the um, stock market, I mean, supply, you know. So, so they found the correlation between the supply, the logistics movement, 
and uh, to the malls, how, how many uh, costs are going there, going out. So something they calculate and uh, predict the uh, stock market. So is there any way we can use this? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, they sell this um, satellite uh, images every day. It costs some 25,000K or something. Um, so this type of new data can enhance the uh, stock uh, prediction. Wow, so let me answer it as directly as I can. Um, we, so we wanna help clients convert a real world problem into something that could run on a quantum computer and then run it on the quantum computer and make sense of the answers so mm -hmm. that we can come back and make an answer for them. And so we started with stock market data because we found a way to reformulate it that had never been done before. I mean, some of the stuff we read, I gotta tell you, it's so ridiculous. It was like, we bucket returns into five buckets, like A, B, C, D, and E. And then we just look at A, B, C, D, and E. There's no rigor, right? So we love this. because, And then we, we reformed it, we put it on the D-Wave, we ran it, we scaled it, we sh lifted and shifted it. And now we're confident enough to go on Medium and and maybe even trade ourselves on it. Although today it's just for public exposure. The idea of predicting the stock market tomorrow. Wow. Um, I don't know where I would get a clean math formulation to be able to do that. So what, what my answer would be is if you gave me a math belief system, Jeff, I want you to look at uh, federal, you know, Federal Reserve Bank uh, balance sheet. I want you to look at the number of people that cross the threshold in the mall. I want to look at the number of trucks on the highway, the number, the amount of gas consumed, um, the number of airplanes in the sky, all those things. We would then have to figure out how to turn that into hard math and then make it work on a quantum computer. It, it may be that that's a gate computing type of a solution versus annealing. And then we would come back to you and say, well, we think we could do it this way. And then we would have to be able to run it classically to be able to make sure that our formulation on the quantum computer was accurate. So I, I guess I would say, if I don't understand the math, I don't want to do it. I, I do, by the way, want to give credit to the head of algorithms at Google. The, the quantum algorithm leader at Google and I had a short coffee. I wanted to know if Google wanted to go in on this, right? Google can make a lot of money in the stock market. But they said, Jeff, there's too much debate about how to pick stocks. No, thank you. Give me a simpler problem. So we're looking for the simple problem, right? Like, like one example, um, that I think would be great was on fixed income. So Lachlan Chrissy is a real estate broker. And he said, Jeff, can you look at collateralized mortgage? I'm paraphrasing. He didn't really say it this way. Can you look at collateralized mortgage obligations? Look at the underlying housing that it's based on and run that through a quantum computer. Predict failure rates of a CMO. What a great idea. Yes, I think that we could do. Um, when we first started in this business, we were in talks with a pizza delivery company, a big one, not Domino's. And we were gonna look at driver performance and delivering pizzas and whether we could program that into a quantum computer and come back with some heuristics for each store. The answer is yes. I think we understood that math cleanly we could have reformulated on a quantum computer and run it and give them great answers. We could probably run it once a day or even once a month per store and give them a good answer. So that's what we're really looking for is to be able to convert problems. Jeff, this is Ramesh. Uh, the, the CMO market is actually a good place to focus. Uh, um, I think somewhere between 1.5 upward trillion. Uh, in terms of the size of the market. I do know that Fannie Freddie are making big investments in terms of 
digitizing their um, uh, core as well as uh, uh, mortgage and risk management uh, capabilities. So um, I don't know if they have interest on quantum side, but they do have a big enough portfolio where they are looking at streamlining the whole value chain and uh, might be a place you may want to take a peek in. Okay. So, so I'm going to, so, so what else would be interesting for you guys in terms of um, conversation? I'm willing to go almost anywhere. I'd like to stay in the realm of using a quantum computer to pick stocks. Um, ask more questions. There's a lot of people on who haven't said anything. Yeah, some names I recognize. Uh, uh, Jeff, I have two questions um, I wanted to ask. Uh, in your research, what was the investment horizon uh, for the hold? Or how often do you re-optimize? Or what assumptions do you make with respect to ongoing optimizations? It's a great question. So let, let me try to rephrase your question. So Jeff, you're looking at one year data. What would the recommendation be on how long to hold that portfolio, right? Or how often would I have to rebalance it? So it's a moment in time recommendation based on the movement of the stocks. We published our first week. We're going to publish like in a week and a half or so after. I'll be curious to see if the market moved at all. In fact, the two stocks, APA and AMP, are still the two best stocks. And so the market has not shown a big shift right now. Maybe we need a couple of volatile days. What I would say is, let's wait and see each week if the stocks recommended really change. So that would be the first one. But it is buy and hold. So it would be maybe in three months, two months, one month, the underlying movement of the stocks would change. So that would be like if, there's, if it goes risk on to risk off, or if it goes growth to value, you'll see different stocks kind of in the limelight. That's one answer. The second answer is when we ran these numbers, the Federal Reserve Bank was putting a trillion dollars a month into the market. We saw dramatic shifts in our answers. At one point, the Chicago quantum net score was positive, it wasn't negative. So the math, we had to reformulate right in the middle because the market crashed. And so um, it's highly sensitive to like a moving average of the performance of the market. And one of the charts that I showed um, on the first YouTube video where we discovered America, it showed the V shape of the market. And so we think this portfolio optimization tool will be very interesting as markets move aggressively because if we can get the signs right and we can manage through it, you'll see portfolios that maybe fall less in a down market and rise more in an up market, which would give you kind of like a leverage. You could leverage those. A hedge fund would want to leverage those bets. And even if it's six or eight assets, you can actually buy options on those pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll ask another one if I may. Yep. Um, so as part of your analysis, have you had a chance to look at, say, the top 10 best portfolios of a certain size or range of sizes to see whether the stocks in those top portfolios are the same, similar, whether there are common stocks? From a perspective, say you wanted to exchange one or a group of stocks for a different group, which is related to one of the other people, one of the questions someone was asking. So, how much commonality basically is across top performance? Yeah. Thank you. So, I'm going to answer that going back to the heuristics because I don't know that I thought about it as much as you're thinking about it. So, when we came up with our heuristic approach and we talked about all stars and dog stars, once you get comfortable. So once you look at, 
So when we started our research, just to give you some numbers, we looked at 280 stocks. We picked those 280 stocks um, based on most liquidity, highest market cap in major US markets that traded continuously for five years. So once we found those 280, we had a universe to play with. And one of the first things we did is we broke them up into 20 because that was our goal was to optimize 20 stocks. We ran them all on D-Wave. We came back, we picked three all-stars and three dog stars from each. We put those together and we were able to really find like the best stocks. So those names are sticky. So what happens is, and I, I haven't gone back to the research from six months ago, but I bet you if I ran those same 20 asset portfolios, some of those same all-stars would show up. And so I guess the first answer would be, yes, there's commonality. And I mean, right now we just looked at 60 stocks for the medium article and 40 stocks for the archive article, and those aren't going to change. And so, so that's a piece. The, the hard part is, I don't know that you could just swap a different name in the same sector. So, you, you know, you would think that if it was a gold stock, you could just swap Newmont Mining versus Barrick. If it was a computer stock, you could swap Oracle for IBM. But it, it didn't really come out that way. Like certain stocks just had very low volatility to the rest of the stocks. And I believe this could be a factor of buybacks and what we used to have in the old days of market makers. There were people that kept stocks orderly. I was explaining to one of my daughters what a market maker was and that they used to make five cents every time someone traded a share of stock. Oh my God, what a great business, right? but the value was that the volatility was lower. Now there's no market maker, not really. So things go a little crazy. So there's certain stocks that just perform better. They're just less volatile. And those are your all-stars. Those that have a high return and less just native volatility. Did, did that answer okay. your question? Yes, yeah. yes. And perhaps the last one, I uh, don't know if you looked at it. Could you say a bit about the performance differential across say top maybe five different portfolios? Is there one that particularly stands out or there is a very small delta? So I'm gonna show you, um, Alex, don't get mad. I'm gonna show you a spreadsheet that I use to pick the portfolios so you can get a feel for some of the differences in some of the numbers. Um, well, first, before I do that, let me answer one more question that came in. Are you publishing the list of recommended stocks? So the answer is yes on medium. So once the data is out on medium, you know, maybe for a week or so, we'll do a friend link or we'll put it on LinkedIn or we'll put them on our website. <laughs> but I'm doing it on medium again to get the free coffee, right? So if people want to follow us and get that day's answer, just click on the medium link. And if it costs you the five bucks a month, whatever to have medium, that's great. Because what that does is that gives us about a dollar a month in revenue that goes towards something at least. Um, we are looking at publishing our results on Seeking Alpha. Um, Chicago Quantum is a certified author. Um, I just don't know yet. Um, maybe we will. But uh, for right now, because we're a research arm, we're a lab, think of it that way, we just want to put the data out there. If somebody wanted early access to the recommendations, what I would say is we would come up with a slightly different universe of stocks so that we don't make people feel bad. And we would run their universe for them. And then we would, you know, we would, I want to have the same public universe go out at the same time. So uh, I posted the, uh, I posted the medium link on the URL or just search for Jeffrey Cohen or uh, Chicago quantum on medium. It's out there. So 
So go ahead. Let's see if there's more questions. I don't want to go into a rat hole, but I will. Let me just tell you that the difference in performance for your your low risk portfolios was 9.35% to 10.24% annual return. So you're talking about less than a 1% move and your standard deviations varied from 1.9 to 2.1%. So it wasn't a lot of shift, but we're having a lot of people drop. So I guess I'll open it up for more questions for the people that can stay. And you're very welcome, John. <laughs> hey, Jeffrey, I have a question. Hi, David. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the uh, page 13 here on the paper. Yep. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak more about the um, mathematical adjustments that the model requires um, when indices, indices decline or um, when interest rates drop close to zero. Yep. So the first thing I'll just tell you what we have right now in the model. And um, so what we have right now in the model is when interest rates drop below zero, we keep them at zero. So that would affect your sharp ratio because you don't get any lift from a risk-free return. Um, I, I haven't thought about what to do with negative interest rates yet because we're not betting on the direction of the stock market, there's no like lift. Okay, interest rates are negative, so I'm gonna get more stock market lift. The, um, the mathematical adjustment. So when the Chicago quantum net score, when the variance outweighs, dramatically outweighs the returns, you end up with a positive score. And so normally, like right now, we're seeing scores of, uh, negative zero, zero something, zero, zero, seven, zero, zero, five, negative zero, zero, three. So that means your expected return, the way we did our power shift, which was a three, allows it to stay a little negative. And so then we can minimize, so all our math minimizes it and we roll. So if the market were to either be very much more highly volatile or returns were to drop, let's say we have a 10% drop in the market, then we either change the power. So instead of to the third power, you can imagine it uh, returns to the second power. So now returns get a more of a boost. So I can still be negative. Or we have to, um, power is probably the largest adjustment. The second would be, instead of minimizing, would we possibly swap them? Would we do expected return minus variance and minimize that? It's very easy for us to make that change. So if it's expected returns minus variance, high variance gives you a negative answer. I want to minimize that ratio. The good news is we know this runs really well on the D wave. So I think that's the other option we would do. That's actually what we did when the market dropped was we played around with the, with either the signs or the direction of this, of the subtractions. Yeah. If, if we find real market turbulence next time, I'll probably like open up the phone lines and ask for people to collaborate. Um, we're on Twitter. So if I start tweeting about negative returns, maybe just uh, direct message me. I'll put my Twitter, the Twitter handle for our company here. Uh, it's a big deal. Um, once the market really um, shifts to a negative run, uh, it's, uh, you have to be a little bit more delicate, right? I think the power transformation and reversing the signs are what's gonna do it for us. And Jeff, you were trying to get into some Excel and I, got, I think you got distracted into another question. It, it doesn't, I, I, I gave you kind of the sense of it, which is the best portfolio to like the fifth best portfolio. Right. There's not that much movement. Uh, again, because there's so many of them. The, the best portfolios tended to group at the top. So, and the way we did that is when we got our D-wave answers, 
we get an energy value from D wave. Could be negative two, positive two. We then have to factor how much we scaled for that portfolio. And then we get exactly the right Chicago quantum net score. We kind of watch out for runs where we had a really great Chicago quantum net score because that tended to be the portfolio size where we had the best answers. But we don't cheat. We don't just run for one or two size portfolios. We still run it across the whole spectrum. So we're still running 55 assets, 45 assets, 35 assets through. And that's actually what's giving us the nice coverage of the efficient frontier. And so at the end though, the best, at, the best portfolios tend to stand out from the crowd. The, the reason I bring that up is when we do Monte Carlo analysis and we do random, nothing stands out. Right. Like almost all the portfolios are just okay. Um, I used to wonder why the sharp ratios and all the research papers were so horrible. I mean, we're driving sharp ratios now of 5.0 because the market's been hot, right? I, in the papers, I'd see sharp ratios of 1.5. <laughs> I mean, I would never want to put my money into something that lame. So, all right, more, more questions or more topics? Jeff, I was curious if your uh, universe uh, included ETFs or was it just stocks? Just stocks. It, it can include ETFs. Um, we were actually trying to give some uh, competitive room to financial engines. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> financial engines, which is now bought by an investment manager, they're yeah. doing ETFs and mutual funds. There's actually a bunch of competition in picking mutual funds. So that's why we picked just you the know, underlying stuff. I, I, I was just asking that because if you have at least uh, the ability to have that data if, and you, you're picking uh, portfolios with your um, quantum score, uh, Chicago quantum uh, scores, um, you could at least uh, use that to benchmark uh, against, uh, you know, whether, whether, I mean, uh, ETFs by themselves are portfolios, uh, right? So I, I was just curious if, it, you know, that's kind of down the stream where you might be going in terms of uh, building the portfolios with your quantum uh, scores, uh, doing the comparison both directly and indirectly. Yeah, that would mean the model would be something like uh, needed to be augmented for nested levels. If you well, as, and segmentation too, right? Nested levels and segmentation. You talked about yeah. Um, the growth uh, portfolio, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Jeff talked about adding options to add baffles when you have risk, uh, you know, upside or downside risk you want to kind of take advantage of, um, right? So the, what that gives us basically is a wide landscape of segmented portfolios in a three-dimensional uh, space. Right. I mean, it's, it's going to be a really high level of complexity because even if you pick any ETFs and normally what is displayed to most of uh, laymen and people normal like us is top 10 holdings. Right. The, the, I, I don't think you need to evaluate or compete across that whole space. You can probably do a, a tiered selection process. Right. To narrow that space and, uh, you know, uh, which will give you a smaller universe to look at. Correct. I mean, then, then you have to decide, okay, I'm going to pick up five ETFs maybe, and I'm going to pick up 10 top holdings of those five ETFs to analyze. Then mm -hmm. still we are leaving a lot of room there in terms of preciseness. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious if, I mean, if that's where you guys are heading so, off. So, uh, you, so you made me think of something that I never thought before. Yeah. So, so now I owe both of you a cup of coffee. Um, Thank you. So think about this for a minute. Okay, so we publish, a, um, a, so it's easy to publish a score of individual stocks because no one's feelings get hurt unless you didn't pick their stocks, right? Their company. So the president may not like me, but whatever. <laughs> but now imagine if I do 
Vanguard versus Fidelity. Now you're talking. Right? Now you're talking. Okay. That's exactly what you should be doing. I could put in different, like Kemper, right? Let's run Kemper versus Vanguard. Now you're talking. Yeah. Because and that's the, that's what you have to benchmark against if you are going to promote. Uh, this is what you have to do. Up, you could so pick up five to nine more. Yeah. You got to put the data out and benchmark against it. Yeah, and pick up easiest ones, which are least, and people mostly focus on on these as Vanguard and Fidelity five to nines, for example. And so, right. but imagine playing the big players, yep. international fund, with, with the same objectives, of course, right? So we pick 10, 20, by the way, 60 mutual funds in the same class, Oh, now we have all stars and we have dog stars. Exactly. So this, uh, the reason I was asking that question, Jeff, was when you talked about increasing the size of your portfolio, I was actually very skeptical about it based on the finding that you already have, which is that a smaller set of portfolio, uh, stocks in a portfolio perform better. And we, we know that why that is so. It, what is more interesting is going through a broader set of the other portfolios, bringing them into the universe, running quantum against that to benchmark, and then you determining where do you fit in that landscape and rank, run, rank them end to end. So, so let, me, let me try to, so first off, I love this conversation. So the reason why- By the way, wanna... for the rest of the people on, Jeff was my former boss, he yes. hired me in five minutes, I would say, and uh, I love him deeply. And uh, it's it's wonderful. He's uh, he's brilliant in many different ways, uh, uh, and we have these kind of conversations constantly. Thank you very much. It's true. So, uh, but that doesn't mean I'm going to be any easier on Ramesh when its questions come in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's why we want to go bigger. So first off, we want to test the quantum computer. Right. Okay. So if it can do 80 assets, 100 assets, 200 assets, this is a, it's a real test because um, I remember I, I had a meeting with GE Research. They were doing aircraft maintenance using a quantum annealer. Mm -hmm. And imagine aircraft maintenance in one building is not that hard, but they wanted to figure out what building and what line does every repair order go to? It was a very big, complex Cubo. It ended up, they couldn't get an answer. So what I wanna do is run up against the highest, most complex problem that the D-Wave can solve with the 2000, and then the most complex one for the 5000. So if we call a customer, I can reasonably expect how big of a problem I can solve, right? How big is this tool? But the other is we ran 60 stocks and that got me through my universe of A, B, and C stocks. But I really want to run A through Z. I really want to run all the stocks and have all the covariances of all the different combinations. Because for example, right now I just made a recommendation, but what if there was a stock that started with the letter zebra or X-ray and we missed? So I would have to run A through C, D through F, whatever, and then bring them together and hope that my heuristic worked. Mm -hmm. I'd much rather run the whole S&P 500 at once. That's why we want to go bigger. I'm still expecting six, eight, 10 stocks, but I, I don't want to have to manually put together all stars to piece together the stock market. So right now, I still need to use D-Wave to do that. I want to give you the equivalent of why we don't run today on gate computers. I hope there's nobody on from uh, a gate computing manufacturer. If, if you are, just stay quiet and then you can yell at me later um, or anyone watching the video. So we have access if we want it, want to pay for it to six qubits or five qubits for free. That means I have to do six assets at a time. Mm. 
to do the S and P, let's just make it the S and P 600. I got to do a hundred portfolios. <laughs> And then it's like the final four. I got to pick one good stock out of all of them and then run them again. And like, I could be there all day just mm -hmm. trying to get through 600 stocks. At least with 60, I run it 10 times and then I run it maybe another 10 times and I get down to 60 good ones. So I really want my uh, unit of measurement to be 100 stocks. If I can get to 100 stocks, we mm -hmm. could burn through an S&P 500 or a Russell 2000 pretty fast. That's why we want to go bigger. That's fair. But I, 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 I do still think, Jeff, if I may say so, that if you take, um, you know, one of the uh, funds, mutual funds are good targets to go after. Um, okay. Um, but the ETFs provide you the data. The data is available. But if you can look at the mutual fund themselves, the portfolio is pretty open. Um, most of them are. Uh, I was just curious if that, will give you more bang for buck as well. So the, so I, so it depends on what market we're trying to serve. If I'm serving individual investors or managers, fund managers, fund to fund managers, individual investors probably want to invest in ETFs, QQQ. Hey Jeff, how's that doing? Should I hold QQQ with the, uh, with the spider, with the spy? Should I hold that with, maybe a commodity one or a currency one. Um, yeah, there's some real value in looking at an ETF as a proxy, as a stock, right? Um, to cover an industry sector. The other way to look at it though, is to compare ETFs or mutual funds that have the same objective to figure out which ones are, are performing better. And so, that one's a different market. Now I become a morning star, right? That's, that's not a market I want. I want them as my customers. But, but if, you if you are able to productize the quantum net score with a portfolio that let, let's call it Chicago quantum as an ETF, you have broader distribution, you are benchmarked against the others. I, I don't think and, we're going to become an investment have an access to it. Right. So I'm just, I'm just trying to lay this yeah. out in a way. Maybe you, your team can think about it. Uh, I know you're going after the consumer in this approach, but what I see is that the consumer adopting it and you having to run individual scores on their portfolio. That is a, that's a major labor effort in my opinion. Yes. Right. E even an app would then have to go to the D wave every time. Right. Yeah, no, you're right. So we can have a private conversation about business models, but uh, at least what we're prepared to say right now is we're looking at stocks because we want to show the world that we can do this. Um, it's not so much to become an investment manager. We don't want to compete with our clients. Mm -hmm. Thank but, you. So David, Yefum, any more questions? Um, Ed Katz, I'm gonna call you out. I see you're out there. Anything you wanna ask? We And Ed and I met in California, so that's why I'm calling him out. Ed, you are on mute or something? Just maybe say hello? <laughs> no. Is, uh, is Chicago Quantum mainly focused on finance? Is it exclusively focused on finance? So we originally were open to any industry. What I would say is it's the um, discrete industries. So um, we like finance, we like insurance, we like asset management, um, but we can do very well in any of the logistics, supply chain, manufacturing, distribution, um, retail, publishing, uh, things like that, high tech. Um, we're probably not going to add value at all in material science. We're not going to invent batteries. We're not going to do drug discovery. We're, we're not, um, we're not a continuous manufacturing set of expertise. Uh, we will do government work. So we do have a gauge number. We will take um, military contracts. We will do research for federal, state, and local governments. Um, eager to serve 
if necessary in those areas. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers. Yeah, that answer's fine. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, we, we, it was funny. So I remember the meeting when we picked portfolio optimization. So what had happened was we were positioning ourselves as the um, people that could help you understand quantum. It was too broad. It was too general. Uh, everyone wanted a free call. No one wanted to pay for it. Who are the big hardware providers? Well, great. So we published on our website, people stopped calling us. Um, we had to pick one problem that we could go deep. And once we picked portfolio optimization, by the way, there's like a hundred patents we had to read. We read all these research papers. We articulated the problem. And then we finally got to where we understood the D-wave. So it took a really specific problem to give us, uh, to give us the muscle to be able to now work it. And even today, I emailed D-Wave about the simulated annealer, and they're giving us things to try. So we we just get our muscles get stronger in the ability to use the D-Wave system. Um, apart from just reading the documentation, we're we're getting much deeper. So that helps us. How can somebody who's like freshly graduated, just out of school, how can they, um, I guess, develop more expertise around these things? Like personally, I've been trying to um, read up on, on D-Wave and uh, have taken a look at the examples that they have on their websites. Yep. Um, I've also taken the time during the pandemic to um, read up on like a couple of quantum computing textbooks Makes sense. Yep. Keep going. Yeah. I, I would like to get into this field of like applying uh, quantum computing to finance. So, so I'm guessing like, I'm just wondering what kind of like, what kind of background do you have on, on quantum computing or is it mainly like a finance expertise that you bring? So and also, sorry, one, one, one more question. No, just, yep. I was wondering like, what's the size of, of your research group? Like, do you guys, um, do you use students or do you have, all industry experts. All right, so let me let me run through. So the the first thing I would say is go to Quantum Palooza. So Quantum Palooza is um is the University of Harrisburg website where they're tracking all of the different training and education. Plus, they ran like a summer camp for two weeks. Um, that's a really good uh, place to start meeting people and getting real deep into some content. And it's Quantum Palooza, it's fun, right? Um, Alex Khan, who's on the team, actually is helping teach some of those classes. So he's actually sitting with people on Zoom, showing them the spreadsheet, how to simulate a D-Wave, <coughs> getting into the code. You can go on D-Wave and get a minute free. But how I learned is probably not the easiest way to learn. So I come with, I don't even know that I, I would say I'm an expert in anything. I'm a management consultant. So my skill was always throw me out of an airplane. And by the time I hit the ground, I better be an expert because I'm showing up at the client. <laughs> and so fast learning. And so I remember one of my uh, colleagues, another executive at IBM, when I told him I was gonna be studying quantum, he's like, you should read this book. It's called The Dancing Wooly Masters. By the way, great book. If you haven't read it, The Dancing Wooly Masters. Um, it's like a Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance for quantum. It just, it feels nice when you read it. You get a pretty good understanding of things. You can't really program based on it, but it feels good. And I read that and then I bought a couple of physics textbooks, which I never opened. I printed off a whole bunch of quantum research articles. I read a few of them. And then I just found a problem to solve. And that's when I learned. So to be honest, all the reading and research and, and videos, I didn't learn a thing. I got into a problem. And so my wife and I, her name's Diana, my wife and I were talking about another problem to solve. And so 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. Virendra, you got it. You have to get your hands dirty in a real problem. And so what I would say, David, pick a problem, like a real one, like uh, something that matters to you. Just dig in. Dig into the classical math. By the way, you have to learn Python. So dig into the classical math, code it on Python, and then go to D-Wave and try. And there's people out there, by the way, there's a community on D-Wave, there's us. Post a question, I'm, I'm glad to answer it. From our company's perspective, I did pick up a couple of volunteers, uh, which we vet, we interview them. We're glad, we're right now, because we're pre-revenue, we're all volunteers. So if you're willing to work for free, we promise that when we start to make money, the money follows the work. This isn't one where the company keeps all the profit. This is one where the workers keep all the profit. The company grows because we have happy customers. And so we'll work with you, right? Maybe you can learn Python working with us. Maybe you can learn the D-Wave. You get your minute free, start running some experiments. Next thing you know, you're like, hey, Jeff, right? I think I found quantum advantage somewhere. I was doing a problem on something that was important to me and I found something I can't quite figure out what it means. And 99 times out of 100, it's probably something we can explain away. And maybe that one time, you're the hero who discovered it. So that's what I would say is find a problem that's interesting. I love the stock problem. Maybe if you were to work with us, I'd say, let's look at fixed income. Let's pick bonds for US top traded companies and try to model them on a D-wave. By the way, I think I have a client that would pay for that. So that'd be a great example. Or maybe you say, Jeff, I want to do Bitcoin. I want to do Bitcoin versus the other cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin versus treasuries. Right, that's, or maybe you care about COVID. I mean, Alex is looking at the spread of COVID, right? What, what measures can you take to reduce the spread of COVID? Um, that for people that are interested, like in the medical field or science, there's plenty there. We, we have a friend, uh, Dr. Marwan Salhi, who looks at wind farms. He All day long, he runs D-Wave to optimize wind farms. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot to do out there. Just pick one. Yeah, call me. I put my stuff in the, in the chat. So... Um, if you really want to reach out, just read the tweets too. That'll help you to get started. And then uh, we can work with you. I mean, if you don't want to work like for us, you can work with us as an associate. And then when we get paying clients, we share the work. All right, Balaji, yeah. I think we've gone two hours. And so maybe I hand it back to you. Yes, so okay. Yeah, I recorded the session should be available uh, in the meetup page. And also, thanks, uh, Jeffrey, for uh, giving you a wonderful talk. And it was most uh, like a conversation, and uh, it was more interesting for them uh, than just a talk. And uh, uh, question and answer session was uh, a great, and uh, a lot of participation. Virendra asked a lot of questions, and it was interesting. So um, anybody interested uh, to contact uh, the contact uh, detail of uh, Jeffrey's uh, quantum, uh, I mean, uh, Chicago quantum uh, is there. So any um, association as a business partner, you can try. Uh, so uh, with that, um, anybody uh, still have some questions, you can send in the uh, email to Jeffrey and get the answers. So we'll conclude this now. Any uh, final comment, Balaji. Thank you for organizing this topic, this show and the wonderful Jeff and Alex. That's the uh, topic very thanks close everyone. to my heart. And I believe that they answered the quite good questions. And uh, I mean, to give you a quick 30 seconds spiel, we started this group last August. And coming forward today, I believe I'm happy I joined the group and thanks to Balaji. And we have been coming together to get right host and get the right kind of topics and something to solve some meaningful problems. And this is one of them. With that, I'll say thank you very much again. Uh, you Thanks welcome. Thanks. That's terrific. Thank you.
All right. I'm dropping. Take care now. Yep. We'll talk on Monday. Yes, sounds great. Yes. Thank you. Thanks.